Uh, good evening, everybody, and hello from the British Museum. Uh, and let me welcome you to our event relating to this exhibition arising, uh, to this event arising from our exhibition, Luxury and Power, Persia to Greece. Uh, my name is Jamie Fraser. I'm the curator for the ancient Levant and Anatolia here uh, in the Middle East Department of the British Museum. And I'm the lead curator on this exhibition. And boy, do we have a treat for you this evening, because I have with me well, with me virtually anyway, three um, enormous brains who went into developing this exhibition alongside me. And I have to say, all the good ideas in this exhibition come from the three speakers you're about to hear in some format or another. Um, first up, we're going to hear from Dr. Sinjin Simpson, my colleague in the Middle East Department. Sinjin is the curator responsible for ancient Iran, Central Asia, Arabia, um, and in addition to conducting extensive excavations in Iraq and Central Asia, he's published several books, including Afghanistan, A Cultural History, and the Begram Horde, Indian Ivories from Afghanistan. And Sinjin's going to talk to us about crafting uh, metallic objects from the Oxus treasure. You'll then hear briefly from Professor Lloyd Llewellyn Jones. Lloyd is Professor of Ancient History at Cardiff University, and a specialist in the history of ancient Persia, the Near East, and ancient Greece. He's the author of numerous books and articles, including Persians, The Age of the Great Kings, Ancient Persia, and the Book of Esther, the Achaemenid Court, uh, Culture in the Hebrew Bible, and a forthcoming study of Hellenistic queenship, Cleopatra's Forgotten Queens of Egypt. And then finally, uh, we'll hear from Muhammad Hassan Nuera. Hassan is one of the world's leading experts in the production of Tyrian purple dye. He has been actively involved in the reproduction of this forgotten craft since 2007 and currently owns the world's biggest collection of Tyrian, Tyrian purple pigment extracts. His work has been exhibited in many institutions around the world, including in this exhibition at the British Museum, the Harvard Art Museums, and museums in Switzerland as well. The costumes that you see in the British Museum exhibition were recreated by Lloyd and the purple extract that you can see in this exhibition is, uh, were created by Hassan. So it's only appropriate that Sinjin, Lloyd and Hassan come together now to share with you far more information about how crafting ancient luxury goods bestowed upon them that status of a luxury. Um, I ask you to use the Q&A function in Zoom to put forward questions for a Q&A session, which will take place at the end of the event, depending on timing, um, and then they'll be forwarded through to me. But first up, I will welcome uh, Dr. Sinjin Simpson to take over. Sinjin, over to you and the Oxus Treasure. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to see you all, um, virtually at least. So. The Oxus Treasure needs little introduction to all of you, um, but I will nevertheless give you one. It was found uh, over a period of a few years in the 1870s at a place called Tahti Kuwad, which you can see on the far right of the map. So that's a map of the Achaemenid Empire marked in red, stretching from Europe and Libya deep into Central Asia. And we have this collection of objects in the BM which come from the eastern end of that empire. So they form the centerpiece of our display here in the Rahim Irvani Gallery for Ancient Iran, which now marks its 15th year since opening. And a selection of them are, of course, in Jamie's exhibition. It's the largest collection of Achaemenid gold and silver work from a single find and therefore gives us a huge amount of insight and information into uh, the Achaemenid Persian Empire. This uh, gives you an idea of where it was found and perhaps how it was found. Um, the 19th century Russian intelligence reports indicate that it was found on the riverside of a small mound on the Tajik side of the border with Afghanistan. It's a mound that has never really been properly investigated archaeologically. And as you can see from the view on the left, uh, has a series of old Russian military trenches on the top. 
And this is a view uh, unpublished uh, that I took there as um, one of two people, the first Brits probably to stand on top of this site uh, in history. In the center, you've got a small fragment of a column base uh, that fell out of the section um, and is lying at the bottom of the site, indication of some monumental building. And on the right, you can see a, a colored postcard from about 1900 showing Russian and local um, workers and gold prospectors washing the sides of mounds. And this is um, a possible a technique that was used throughout Central Asia at this time to um, to find gold. Uh, uh, and I suspect was was used at this site as soon as the reports of artificial gold, you know, worked gold started to travel around the region. And therefore, it might explain why so much material uh, literally washed out of the side of the mound. So this is um, a, a photograph uh, of the some of the Oxus treasure um, uh, on display in the British Museum. It was acquired as a group um, through bequest by one of our greatest ever curators, uh, Augustus Wallace and Franks in 1897. And it was put on display in the Gold Room in 1900. And this is a view of um, the um, objects prior to any conservation uh, on their first display. And now to quickly run through the objects, to give you an idea of the composition, we've got uh, the famous armlets, We've got small bangles, earrings, and pendants of different styles, uh, hammered sheet uh, appliques originally stitched onto clothing, finger rings, uh, mostly in Western Achaemenid style, probably from Turkey, the gold cover of um, a highly decorated uh, Achaemenid type of short sword or scabbard, two small three-dimensional gold models of chariots which are miniature versions of a type that we see represented on the reliefs at Persepolis on the left a small number of luxury tablewares uh, cups beakers fragments of um, vases and so on statuettes in gold and gilded silver of different styles and different forms of dress, and almost certainly from different parts of the empire. A large number of um, embossed or engraved votive plaques showing um, men carrying sticks, which they are about to offer to a fire temple, and the best evidence that some of these objects were intended to be deposited uh, in a religious setting. So taken as a group, there are several things I think that are worth noting. Um, firstly, many of the objects have been damaged, cut, twisted, or stripped of their inlays. Some of this may have happened in the 19th century um, before um, they entered the British Museum collection, but most of it probably happened, in my view, in antiquity, um, as these are signs really telltale traces of objects that are being valued for their precious metal uh, and are being hoarded. So we've seen this map before, and some of you might have seen this map before in the Scythians exhibition at the BM a few years ago. We've got the empire in red. We're used to the British empire in red here. We've got the Persian empire in red. And the fine spot of the Oxus treasure in the eastern end. So if you look above the empire, you see lakes, seas, deserts, and the sort of endless steppe of Central Asia, um, linking Europe and China um, through the steppe corridors. And that map, to me, is very, very important for understanding part, at least, of what the Oxus treasure is. Because historically, the Persians had several run-ins with these northern neighbours. In 530 BC, Cyrus the Great is killed fighting um, a, a tribe known as the Masagetai somewhere near the Aral Sea. In 
territories probably more familiar to the Scythians than to the Achaemenids. 522, a Scythian ruler called Skunka, is shown on an Achaemenid victory uh, relief at Bisatun in Western Iran. And in 513 or thereabouts, Darius, the man who commissioned that relief, campaigns north of the Black Sea, somewhere north of Crimea, unsuccessfully looking for Scythians that he can bring to heal, leaves, leaves a victory stealer um, found recently in excavations in Crimea, um, but returns relatively empty handed. So these people to the north are formidable foes uh, and also um, valuable for a major resource that the Achaemenids needed, and that's gold. Because there are major sources of gold in the rivers of southern Siberia and in the region of the Urals, uh, approximately halfway across the Scythian territories. And I think it's for those reasons um, that we see here Scythians being represented at Persepolis as so-called tributaries, bringing robes, armlets, undoubtedly of gold, and horses, because of course they are horse-breeding nomads. So this relationship of settled empire and the unsettled to the north, I think is a very important um, feature of the relations between the two. In Achaemenid miniature art, sometimes this manifests itself as conflict. So you have an Achaemenid royal hero or king on the left firing an arrow at point blank range into a, a Scythian who's, who's decided to wield a battle axe instead of a bow. And here we have two illustrations of a form of warfare that we don't think of as being the warfare of the steppe. So on the left, a relatively recent find in a Scythian tomb in Kazakhstan of a wooden comb here reconstructed, showing figures in a Persian dress trampling Scythian. So this is a victory in the Achaemenid eyes. And on the right, a brand new discovery that was announced a day ago from southern Russia, Siberia, of a charioteer buried with the bronze uh, belt fitting that you can see in the grave and at his waist, which would allow him to tie the reins of the chariot to his belt and therefore keep his hands free uh, for, for warfare. This is the first tangible proof that chariots were being used by the Achaemenid enemies in the northern steppe, if it isn't in fact possibly a piece of booty from some Scythian triumph over charioteers of the Persian army. It's a brand new find and it's something to um, keep in mind. So there are elements of sharing at times of peace between these two mighty um, rivals and elements of that extend to dress because a major feature of Achaemenid dress is a riding costume which was effectively brought in on horseback from the steppe and adopted in the Persian Empire. But alongside that, as our colleague Lloyd will explain, you have a tradition of ceremonial robes with false sleeves draped over the shoulders, much as they still do in Central Asia and Afghanistan, to denote status and, um, and so on. And these robes that you see being worn by the two figures on the right from the Oxus treasure are types of robes that survive very exceptionally uh, as locally made versions in the frozen tombs of Pazarek in Siberia. So there are similarities in concept, uh, although perhaps not in design, uh, between the elite dress forms and the everyday forms of these two rivals. 
But in addition to design concepts, there are also some objects moving across borders and moving across cultural zones. So on the right, we have a glazed brick uh, from Susa, from a accumulated palace, palace in southwest Iran, and an applique of gold, uh, of again, of a lion's head, roaring in the traditional Near Eastern form. And on the left, you have felt cutouts stitched on to a felt rug found at Pazarik in the Altai region of Siberia, a region where obviously no one ever saw a lion, uh, but have been inspired by imports coming out of the Achaemenid world. And for the last slide here, I'm showing examples of objects that illustrate this transfer of concept, I think, even more um, vividly. So on the right, we have examples of inlaid gold um, um, bangles, effectively, found in an Achaemenid tomb at Susa, southwest Iran, which have the coloured inlays that are missing from the Oxus treasure, but here intact because these objects were buried in a grave. A form of polychrome decoration that is ultimately drawn from Egypt, but translated into the Achaemenid gold working through the workshops, I believe, of Phoenicia. And on the left, you have a, a pair of earrings uh, broken in antiquity, badly mended in antiquity, which have the same sorts of ideas of cloisonné inlay and enamel, which were again found in the Pazaric region of southern Siberia, and which are clearly Achaemenid imports um, worn by this um, lady of, of um, high status. So to bring it all to a close, what the Oxus treasure does is make us think hard about the composition and origin of the objects that we have. And we're now about halfway through a major research project uh, with the Department of Scientific Research in the BM, looking at the gold working techniques and the compositions so that we can understand the amount of craft variability in the treasure. And then by working with colleagues in other museums who have comparable accumulated uh, material, we can start to, I think, tease out what may be made in Central Asia, what might be made somewhere in other parts of the empire. And from that, I think, understand the variability within Achaemenid um, craft workmanship beyond the court style and the luxury world of the peripatetic court. So watch this space. Um, more results will be coming out and we will be putting the first results out in the Iran gallery at label level um, sometime in the next year. Thank you. Oh, fabulous. Thank you very much, Sinjin. Um, and remember, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat. And if we have a QA and a session at the end, depending on timing, we'll uh, be able to ask questions then. To show a photograph of an excavation that's happened a day ago is pretty phenomenal. I think you've done well for us here. That was really exciting stuff. And that chariot belt is mind-blowing. Plus, somebody called Skunker. You can't go wrong. <laughs> Um, to move on to Lloyd, one of the two great pleasures in preparing this exhibition has been collaborating with Professor Llewellyn Jones, um, particularly Lloyd and his expertise at costume design and, and ancient costume research. And one of, the, one of the main exhibits that has been drawing people in to this exhibition causing comment are these two costume recreations that Lloyd has done, in part sponsored by the British Institute of Persian Studies and in part by the research board here at the British Museum. It has been a wonderful journey for both of us to go on. Lloyd, please share it with us now. Well, thank you very much indeed. And, and yes, Jamie, you're absolutely right. Of course, it has been uh, a really wonderful journey. I've enjoyed um, this project enormously. Just to have that uh, opportunity, really, to, to, um, to, to put some research into, into practice, uh, take the theory off the page, 
uh, and put it into reality. So this has been uh, uh, an enormous uh, privilege for me. So I, I really want to thank um, uh, BIPS, uh, the British Institute of Persian so Studies, uh, as well as um, my uh, various colleagues at the British Museum uh, for taking on this exhibition. Uh, and also, uh, of course, um, to the makers of the of the costumes, without whom this could never have been possible. Uh, Rebecca uh, Sweetman, uh, and also um, the students at uh, the University of Pontypridd, uh, who created uh, all these wonderful braquettes or, uh, and appliques for me. Now, when uh, Jamie first asked me to be involved uh, in this exhibition. Uh, and took me to look at the uh, sort of mood board he was creating. Um, one thing that stood out for me straight away, of course, was the lack of textiles. Um, and we don't really have many textiles surviving from the Achaemenid period. Uh, we have one or two very famous uh, pieces which were preserved in ice uh, from uh, Pazyric in uh, Crimea. Uh, but these are in uh, the Hermitage Museum, far too fragile, really. Uh, to travel. And so um, we decided, and this is something that the British Museum has never really done before, is to recreate uh, two complete sets of garments, as would have been worn by elite uh, Achaemenid Persians in the middle of the 5th century BCE. Uh, and essentially at that time, the Persians wore uh, two forms of dress. Uh, first of all, on the uh, right hand of the picture there uh, is a long uh, voluminous robe, and the other form of dress is uh, a far more figure-hugging, sewn and uh, cut garment, um, which was used for horse riding. In old books, that used to be called the median dress, but um, there's no way that that was simply um, worn by the Medes. It was also definitely worn by the Persians too. So I want to take you through these two types of garments, illustrate um, how I uh, came to recreate them, what methods I used, what kind of research I did for these garments, uh, and then also a little bit about their meaning in, in, in a Achaemenid cultural context as well. So the um, court garment itself, we're not really sure of the, the name of it in, in Old Persian, although we get some suggestions uh, from the Greeks. It's essentially a, a huge bag-like tunic um, with a simple neck opening sewn up the sides uh, and then belted to form a kind of pseudo sleeves. It's a garment which is very regularly seen in Achaemenid art, both sculptural relief work, as well as in a colorful form in glazed brickwork from Sousa. Sometimes we get miniatures representing this as well, a little ivory piece at the center there showing the drape of the back. But of course, the, the drapery of this garment is uh, artificially rendered in the artwork to fall into perfect regular pleats in a way that fabric simple, simply doesn't do uh, in reality. The same kind of huge um, tunic garments uh, are to be found in later societies, uh, certainly from the tombs of Coptic Egypt, and I give you two examples there. And they were the kind of things that I was looking at, um, just to get the idea of the weight and the scale of the kind of garment that would have been needed for the Achaemenids. On this relief uh, from Persepolis, we can see um, the king himself in yellow and the crown prince uh, there in pink, um, both wearing this supremely um, courtly style of dress. And in fact, it is the form of dress that is most associated with the Persian great king. He's even shown represented wearing it in battle scenes, even though in reality, this would have been the most impractical garment uh, to wear into battle. It's simply far too cumbersome. So therefore, probably when we see this represented in this way in say seal images like this, it speaks of a Persian-ness. It is to differentiate the Persians who are now the masters of this huge empire from the other trouser wearing Iranians or nomadic types um, that are discovered around the peripheries of their empire. So this is the, uh, the garment that the garment design that I came up with. 
Uh, and of course, I had to source all of the materials uh, for it. I uh, managed to find some very, very fine uh, lamb's wool to, to take the bulk of the, the work for me. Uh, and here are just a few shots of the work in progress, uh, trying to sort out how really to put all of this material uh, together. Um, my principal sources here were actually the, um, the glazed bricks from Sousa uh, with all of their magnificent color. But one of the things I realized early on was how there is very much synergy between Greek, uh, between Persian art and Persian dress uh, at the Achaemenid court. So one thing I want to, to include um, was a band of embroidery. And here is a close up of that um, as a work in progress. The embroidery itself actually shows um, a scene of the king in audience, just the sort of thing that we get in, uh, in Persepolis reliefs. And also here we have a, a, a winged sphinx as well, uh, uh, embroidered into this cloth in, in, in um, gold thread and um, uh, red wool. And that too echoes the kind of um, mythological beast that we find in Achaemenid artworks. So the textiles used in this garment were reflecting the kind of uh, court art, centralized court art, um, all around the great king in his palaces. The uh, very fortunate uh, that Sinjin showed you this uh, wonderful appliqued lion's head. Um, this is a form I wanted to replicate, and so I managed to get um, these wonderful, wonderfully created students uh, in Pontypridd University uh, to replicate them in resin uh, and to spray them in this uh, wonderful luscious old gold. Uh, and together with some other um, appliques uh, we created of double-headed lions, um, they were sewn onto the garment, and we decided to hang the garment in its most simple form, uh, without its belt, um, without the full accoutrement that would have gone with it, just to show the, the, the sheer size and scale of the garment, all lined in a deep blue linen. It's exceptionally heavy and very cumbersome, but when worn on the human body, uh, when belted, of course, it is a very elegant dress. It smacks of royalty and it smacks of a, a lifestyle which is not about movement, but about um, sedentary behavior. Uh, uh, indeed, this is uh, our reproduction of the seated king, as it were, from the Persepolis reliefs. Now, the other form of garment then, which is worn, reminds us constantly of the nomadic background of the Achaemenid Persians and that they were supreme horse riders. In fact, in his numerous inscriptions, Darius the Great likes to emphasize that his um, virtuosity in being a bowman, uh, a spearman, but also a horse rider. Uh, and this is uh, by far the, the paramount image that we have of the Persians. So the second garment that we decided to make uh, was uh, a set of riding habit um, for a great king as well. Here, my research took me back, of course, to the reliefs, back to uh, Achaemenid sculpture, uh, some of which was found in uh, Asia Minor, uh, and also, of course, constantly to the reminiscence that these uh, these garments need to, to function on horseback, uh, and in particular in warfare. Um, here we see uh, a little gold plaque of what has become known as the Parthian shot, and the ability to swivel around on horseback and shoot behind, uh, behind you the arrow into the enemy. At Persepolis, while the great king is shown wearing the court robe, the sedentary robe, at least four different delegations of Iranian or nomadic peoples appear in front of him, each of them holding a set of riding garments, uh, a long sleeve tunic, a long sleeve coat, and a pair of trousers with inbuilt uh, feet. And here's a, a colored version of that just to show you it more clearly. This um, motif was so well known that we also find it in the Xanthos tomb in far off Anatolia in Asia Minor. 
uh, here a satrap is being gifted this same uh, series of gifts. So what, of course, is happening in those reliefs from Persepolis is that these nomads are saying to the king, you might be the king of this great empire, but you are also the premier horseman of the empire too. Of course, it's trousers um, that really left their mark on the rest of the ancient world. The Greeks in particular were both besotted and horrified by the idea that any men should ever cover their legs. And I knew therefore that actually getting the trousers right was going to be the hardest part of this job. Now, we do have some actual evidence of Achaemenid trousers, which was discovered um, in the 1990s in a uh, salt mine in northern Iran, not too far from Tehran, where this poor chap um, uh, met his uh, untimely death when a seam of salt trapped him uh, and, and uh, smothered him. The salt, of course, has preserved his, his mummified remains and his clothing extremely well, including the trousers, which we discovered were made of wool uh, and actually had a, a, a piping seam um, down the side. A colleague of mine now based in Vienna, uh, she reproduced uh, these uh, trousers, uh, taking measurements from the original on the mummy uh, and reproduced them in this way. But I discovered when I looked at these trousers that the fabric between the crutch was far too bulky. And of course, it wouldn't really accommodate um, the riding that was necessary uh, in these trousers. And so I went back to the research and I found uh, another example of an old pair of trousers, this time from the middle of the fifth century from Eurasia. Actually, they're probably uh, an early pair of fifth century tr Chinese trousers. And here, what uh, I recognized was the inbuilding of a crotch piece. And this made all of the difference. This answered all of my questions. And so in my own uh, reconstruction of these trousers, what uh, we did uh, working with Rebecca was to create uh, essentially two tubes of fabric for the legs. And then this kind of ziggurat piece uh, which sewed in between them to provide the crotch, which means, in fact, that the legs could be splayed open easily to accommodate sit sit sitting on horseback. Um, evidence for the built-in shoes uh, also was found from uh, early mummies. This time, um, I took a pattern from uh, from um, bog mummies in uh, uh, in Denmark. The coat uh, was the, the next thing to look at, uh, and this large coat, known as a gaunica in Old Persia, was a symbol of extreme importance. Uh, the word gaunica means hairy, and this probably referred to the um, fur lapels that were worn here. This garment wasn't necessarily intended to be worn like a modern coat, but sat on the shoulders, uh, more symbolic than anything else. Our reconstruction was made from numerous panels of three meters long length of cloth, and every part of that cloth was used in the creation of the garment itself. Not one piece of fabric uh, was ever left out. This type of garment had enormous significance to the Persians. In fact, when the Persian king um, was acknowledged as the monarch at a ceremony in the city of Pasargadai, he was not crowned with a crown, but he was invested with a coat of this kind. It was placed on his shoulders, and from therein in, he carried with him the far or the majesty of Persian kingship. And this kind of idea of the um, the, the aura of kingship being passed into the garments of the king explains uh, a, a ritual which we can see in the Achaemenid period. There's evidence for this in the Hebrew book of Esther, right the way through into the medieval world uh, of what we call chaylat, the gifting of robes of honor uh, to individuals. And the final look, which I'm very, very pleased with, worn here with the tunic as well, uh, is shown here for you. Uh, and just to show how um, malleable and uh, pliable these trousers are, uh, here is our model uh, lying down and uh, taking his comfort too. So this has been a, a really remarkable um, 
experiment in uh, reconstruction archaeology for me. Uh, I'm very pleased with the results. Would I do things differently? Maybe if I had a bigger budget, I, I could have. But I think we've achieved what we set out to and have given uh, a good uh, idea of how Achaemenid clothing worked. So, Jamie, thank you very much for your support. Oh, Lloyd, thank you. And I think in a, an exhibition called Luxury in Power, you can't tell that story, as you say, without the role of costumes and textiles. And well, that's amazing, astonishing salt mummy aside, these things don't really preserve. So it adds a huge dimension to the exhibition and one of the most compelling. So thank you very much for being part of it. Um, one of the other compelling exhibits as part of this exhibition, and one of the great pleasures that I've taken in putting the exhibition together, has also been collaborating with a colleague, Mohamed Hassan Nwira. Mohamed uh, Hassan is actually, sorry, I don't know if I've frozen or not. I'll continue on as if I haven't. Hassan is actually dialing in from Tunisia today, and so thank you. Um, and I'll pass over to you to talk about crafting purple pigment and green purple dye. Hassan, over to you. Okay, thank you again very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about the most prestigious color in known history, and the which is also a passion of a lifetime uh, for me. So I'm calling from sunny Tunisia in my dyeing workshop. Um, and before we, we, we move on to the slides, uh, allow me to, to start with a few sentences. I truly believe what I think that many of you would um, share my opinion. I really believe that the word luxury has been abused over time. Obviously, not many things can fall into this category. Not everything can reach this very special level. Luxury is a very special and it's very, it's very unique. And in my opinion, luxury can be defined in three simple words, which are uniqueness, emotion, and desire. And I truly believe that as far as imperial purple is concerned and as far as all of the objects magnificent objects currently being exhibited in the British Museum uh, in the um, luxury and wealth in Persia to Greece uh, exhibition uh, uh, as far as these three characteristics characteristics are concerned really passed the test with flying colors getting back to imperial purple this color of extraordinary characteristics was uh, um, we believe it's been discovered like 4,000 years ago, and it gradually evolved from um, a color of unique, of a unique uh, color of prestige to the absolute symbol of power and wealth and nobility in the ancient world, a color that still fascinates millions of people around the globe, including some of the most powerful and prominent royal families, a color that was that some of the most powerful emperors in ancient times were literally ready to kill for by passing laws to grant them the exclusive use of purple, because probably in the back of, them, of their minds, this color, because of this, if it's extraordinary uh, uh, color fastness and the fact that it has this incredible properties to last for thousands of years, in the back of their mind, they associated this color with eternity. So it was so special for them that only them and the elite had actually the right to, to wear it. So today we're going to briefly talk about the origin of imperial purple, how it was discovered, and um, how it evolved, its characteristics, and how it evolved to become the absolute symbol of power and wealth and luxury in ancient times. And we're also going to tackle the, uh, uh, the, the, the production process in ancient times, and also um, how it is produced in modern times. So um, let me just move on. All right, so we cannot talk about imperial purple without talking about the Kananites, known as the Phoenicians, who lived in modern day um, uh, Syria and Lebanon. Uh, the Kananites um, will forever be associated with the color purple. And actually, they called themselves Kananites, but it's, it was the Greeks who called them Phoenicians because they were so famous for the production of Perian purple. And they were the absolute masters of this industry for over 2000 years. So Phoenician derives from the Greek word Phoenici, which means red purple. So basically associating the Kananites with the, the, the production of purple forever. Uh, the Phoenicians thrived in 
city-states along the Lebanese coasts, and they were top-notch merchants, very, skull, very skilled craftsmen, and they owned their extreme wealth to their sprawling trade network that spans for thousands of, of, of miles across the Mediterranean and far beyond the Pillars of Hercules, giving them access to um, uh, material and all kinds of uh, ingredients that were not accessible to other people across both sides of the Mediterranean. Uh, of course, they owed their maritime super supremacy to their very sturdy uh, 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 commercial vessels that they produced from very resistant uh, types of wood, like cedar wood. The Phoenicians and the Carthaginians uh, traded in just everything, but they were very well known for the trade of uh, or the exchange of uh, luxury items, such as uh, glassware, um, gemstones, ivory, jewelry, and the production of garum, which was one of the most expensive condiments in the ancient world that they produced from the insides of bluefish that they fermented and brined for several uh, months. Uh, uh, and it was a very expensive condiment. But the Phoenicians were very much known for the, mostly known for the production of Tyrian purple, which is a dye with extraordinary characteristics that was produced from specific varieties of mollusks called murex. The pigment was worth over 50 times its weight in gold, and the earliest uh, mentions of Tyrian purple were found uh, in a 6th century BC Babylonian inscription uh, from in the palace of Ashurbanipal, where he clearly states uh, how he imposed uh, uh, many uh, items or attributes to the um, uh, Phoenicians, uh, like purple uh, fabrics and gold and silver, etc. So this was one of the earliest mentions of Tyrian, of Tyrian purple uh, in known history. Uh, the legend of the discovery of Tyrian purple, um, the Phoenician uh, uh, legend, uh, has it that the king of Tyre, Milkhart, was walking on the beach with his dog uh, one day, and the latter came across some murex snails, which he cracked open, and its muzzle turned purple. So Europa, uh, the campaign of, of, of Milkhart, loved this color and asked him and requested a garment dyed with this color. And this is how the legend says that Milkhart uh, uh, found a way to produce the dye and and ultimately dyed a garment for his, his beloved uh, Europa. Here you have a, uh, a magnificent um, a painting um, from uh, Peter Rubens in, uh, in the Museum of Bona in Paris, uh, illustrating this, um, this uh, the, the legend of the discovery of Tyrian purple. Um, this map shows the extent or the scale of the purple dye industry or production on both sides of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean and ancient times. By the second millennium BC, the factories became widespread on both sides of the Mediterranean and presented an ex um, a huge potential, economic potential for both sides, for the populations on both sides of the Mediterranean. Here, all the sites that are marked in red are uh, sites that were uh, tested in historical texts as being uh, purple production centers. The, the sites that are marked in white uh, have been, um, are sites where we found archaeological evidence of the production of purple, and the sites uh, uh, that are marked in both red and white, like Sidon, Tyre, Sarepta in Lebanon, or Carthage and Minax in Tunisia, have been both identified uh, or mentioned in historical texts as being uh, 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 famous purple dying centers in antiquity, but also this has been backed by archaeological evidence on site. Um, now I invite you to see, to have a look at these wonderful uh, dye, uh, purple dyed fabrics. The, 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 one, the first one on top is a fragment of a dalmatic that dates back to the 11th century uh, AD from the Byzantine uh, era um, uh, that is currently uh, being uh, uh, exhibited in the Museum of Valer in Switzerland. And the, the other one is a saddle cloth that has been found in, in a burial tomb in Pasarik that dates back to the 4th century BC. And as you can see, the purples are as fresh as if the fabrics have been dyed yesterday. And this is one of the, 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 the most distinctive characteristic of Tyrian purple is that in contrast with all of the other natural dyes, the more it ages, because of its very complex chemical composition, the more it ages, the more it becomes vibrant because it continues to react with the elements forever. 
Uh, here you, we have two other examples of red purple uh, uh, dyed wool and uh, another example of uh, royal blue uh, uh, wool fabric that were found in uh, Wadi Murabad in the Dead uh, Sea that date back to around 2000 years ago. So the basically because of the uh, unique characteristics of this, of this dye, its brilliance, the uh, how bright vibrant it was but also because it was rare and very very much time consuming to produce literally this dye became the symbol of power and wealth not everyone could afford buying uh, uh, purple and by the second millennium by the second century or the third second century a a ad the romans when nero became an emperor he basically passed laws threatening to kill whomever would uh, uh, um, uh trade in purple or wear purple so basically purple became uh the, the 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 color of the elite nobody else had the right to wear it only the the emperors and the elite by the third century AD one pound of purple dye silk uh was uh valued at a staggering one one hundred and fifty thousand denaries which is by far the most expensive uh, item that you can possibly buy uh, across the whole of the Roman uh, Empire. It's also important to note that when Alexander the Great invaded Susa, he was flabbergasted by the what they call the purple dyed treasure, which consists in several royal robes dyed in purple that that were uh, that, that were like over four hundred years old at the time, and the dye was as vibrant as the uh, as if the fabrics were died yesterday he was completely amazed by the uh the, the the depth and the strength of these of these colors now getting back to the production of purple dye it was mainly produced historically by three varieties of mura of murex the first one sermonita imasoma or blood mouth that produces red purple colors the second one in the middle is the exaplex trunculus that produces violet red, purple, and blue, which is the richest in terms of, of hues. And the third one, the royal Bolinus brandaris that produces pinkish red, purple colors that was mainly used to adjust the color in combination with the two other species. Uh, of course, the color is not produced from the shell itself. The, the shell has to be uh, cracked and the, uh, and, the, um, and the hyperbranchial gland has to be exposed. Then it has to be extracted. And this is how the maceration uh, uh, step will start. We will gather all of these glands. We will let them to macerate in salt for several days until they release all of their juices. And then we transfer them to, um, uh, to cauldrons that are... Uh, uh, let's say in close distance located in close distance to huge furnaces that will allow them to simmer on, on low heat for several days until the dye is fermented and ready to be used to dye the fabrics so this is like an example of the tools that were used to crack the shells open to extract the hypo to, to extract the hyperbranchial gland and each gland that produced a very small amount, a very small drop of what we call the precursor of the, of the dye that was transparent in the beginning, but then with the oxidation under the air and the and the sun, uh, the, the color gradually uh, transforms into purple. So this is an example of the uh, of the uh, uh, of a dyeing factory, uh, ancient dyeing factory based on Pliny the Elder's uh, account. Here you see the furnace and the cauldron and this slow heating process that will allow the 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 the, the diet of ferment to its soluble form here there are some examples of some of the, you know I've tried to match some of the dyed uh, fabrics that I've already dyed over the years or cashmere or silk or wool with some of the illustrations of purple dye in in some ancient mosaics and as you can see the resemblance is quite striking so this is uh, compared to uh, the uh, mosaic illustrating uh, Theodora, Emperor Theodora, um, with uh, a, um, a piece of cashmere that I dyed three times with Tyrian purple. Again here. Now, Tyrian purple ha production has been has stopped for over 600 years, and then it wasn't until uh, the early 1900s that a German chemist, Paul Friedlander, uh, made the first attempts to isolate the pigment and to reproduce the dye. Uh, the dye, Tyrian purple is basically very similar, chemically speaking, to indigo. It's a vat dye. It has, it's not soluble in water. It has to be fermented 
uh, to its soluble form and then only then can the fabrics be dipped into the yellowish liquid and then when they are exposed to the air and the sun they uh, the color gradually develops here you have some illustrations of some of the pure extracts that I produce from different varieties of snails. As you can see, the colors are quite, uh, there's a quite a bit of variety of colors that you can produce. And for some pigments, I can use up to uh, 80 pounds of snails to produce just above one gram of pure extract. We can either proceed that way and produce the pure extract or dry the gland directly in salt, grind them, and this is what was done also in antiquity, uh, and grind them and keep them, they can be stored for years, they can, you can grind them back anytime and then ferment them again and use them to dye your fabrics. Um, it doesn't seem to be working, Simon, if you can uh, move on to the next slide please. Yeah. Yeah, and the next, these are just illustrations. Yeah, here you have the, some examples of the uh, colors that we can have on different types of fabrics, silk, cotton, wool, uh, uh, or cashmere. Uh, you can just move on to the next slide. Yeah, here you can have the royal blue, pink. Silks are amazing. Here you have a silk uh, 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 um, scarf that required over 800 pounds of snails and it took me like over a year to dye. Uh, it required like five different baths of fresh, uh, fresh dye. And um, as you can see, the color is amazingly beautiful. It saturates in blue first and then the purple starts to develop gradually over time. And last but not least, I think that the choice of the purple hue in the St. Edward's crown was uh, was a very good choice because it really matches the genuine red purple that we can produce uh, uh, from the genuine mollusks. Um, thank you again very much for your time. And the floor is yours, Jamie and Vicky. Yes, I thank you very much for that. That purple scarf is astonishing. And I think I know some more people that would walk over cut glass to be yeah. able to do something like that. <laughs> um, and I, I have to say, I jotted down one thing you said, which was the more it ages, the more vibrant it becomes. Yeah. Because yeah. I, that should be on a T-shirt for all of us. Look, thank you very much, Hassan. That thank was you. really quite splendid. Um, okay. I'll now go through some of the questions we've got in the chat. And I'm going to start with you while we've got you, Hassan. This one is from uh, Eduardo. Uh, and he just is asking about the origin of Tyrian. Tyrian as in purple from the Lebanese port of Tyre. Hassan. Yes, exactly, because Tyre was uh, the biggest center of, of purple dye production in antiquity. It was known for the uh, for the very high quality of its dyes, but also uh, known for the huge amounts of purple, of murex that was processed in Tyre. So yes, Tyrian purple derives from Tyre because Tyre was uh, the, let's say, the capital of purple dye production for many centuries. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, Lloyd, you're up next. Brace yourself. This is a question from Lizelle Smith. Lloyd, regarding the heavy robes worn by royalty, would I be right to assume the heavier the robes or the more, most expensive fabric used for creation, the higher the status of royalty? Yes, I, I suppose there's, there's something in that. Uh, we, 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 can't, we can't be absolutely certain on it, but, but I think one of the hallmarks of, of um, fashion and court dress is that court dress uh, always kind of goes further than the fashionable look to make things as either rigid, formalized, or impractical as possible. So if you think about um, the kind of court dress that was worn at, say, in France at Versailles in the 18th century, when women's skirts were held out by these huge panniers, that didn't really follow the fashionable form that was being worn in Paris at the time, but actually it was, was there to, to make a statement in itself. So, I mean, if we think on those kind of uh, lines of, of kind of fashion anthropology, then yes, the, the, the bulkier the garment, the heavier the garment, 
the less movable the garment, um, the more it uh, kind of um, signifies high status, uh, I suppose. Um, so immovability is, is certainly part of that, I would say. Brilliant. And I'll just follow up with another question to you, Lloyd. Uh, an anonymous question, however, the textile showed the trousers had built in boots or shoes. Were these to go over shoes or was the foot bare underneath this? And do we know if the ideas of luxury in this time extended to footwear itself? Um, well, uh, I think they probably were worn with shoes over them. Uh, and certainly from Persepolis, we know that um, fitted shoes uh, were part of the, the fashionable look and that kings had uh, a particular type of shoe uh, with uh, three sort of button loops on each side of the foot. Um, and they're not worn by, uh, by courtiers. So there seems to be a royal shoe. Um, so, uh, and therefore part of this kind of courtly world. The trousers were also worn probably in conjunction with leather chaps which went over the, the top of them, uh, which meant that the fabric of the trousers was saved, um, you know, after hours and hours of, of horse riding. And the Greeks refer to these in the Greek vocabulary, they are known as anaxarides, uh, which, which, which means leather, leather trousers or leather chaps, I think. So I think the combination of leather chaps and probably leather shoes or leather boots um, were worn with, with, these, uh, with these particular um, tra uh, trousers with built-in feet, yeah. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Thank you. Look, we've got time for one more question and then we'll uh, wrap it up. So this last question, Hassan, will grab you while you're still dialing in from Tunisia. A uh, question from Hillary. Are there any modern uses for the purple dye? Very good question. Well, as I said, the, um, the industry of purple dye came to an official halt officially like six, nearly 600 years ago. So basically nobody does this nowadays. Um, only, you know, even my pigments are only, you know, sold to collectioners or museums, etc. But the most people don't even have a clue about how um, uh, difficult and complicated the process is. And for, for now, there is no uh, modern day use, let's say, for purple dye, but hopefully this will change. Um, I currently like provide dyeing services for people from all over the world and they can uh, send me fabrics that I can dye, but they still they are like small fabrics that are uh, uh, let's say kept by collectioners but hopefully we can extend this activity to uh, uh to dyeing something more wearable let's say like scarves and dresses etc and the good thing about murex or the purple dyeing industry is that it's very sustainable uh uh, uh in, in contrast with what many people might think because the whole of the animal is basically used you can eat the flesh you can extract the gland for the dyeing. You can even use the shell as in the production of lime or fertilizers. You can even use your percula as an incense uh, fixative, which was in antiquity a very, very expensive luxury item as well, called known as the devil's fingers, uh, which they used uh, in combination with the other incense ingredients. And this opercula had the miraculous effect of making the incense last much longer and um, uh, and also uh, enhance its fragrance so basically everything is is used and if you are responsible as far as the harvesting of murex is concerned you can ensure the system sustainability of this of this uh, industry of course this not everyone will be able to afford something dyed in imperial purple so it always it will always be like a, a, some kind of a niche uh, product only distant to a very small circle or restricted circle of wealthy people so the production will not be like the industrial scale that we that, that we heard about in antiquity but it will always remain quite limited for a specific type of of, of, of customers so hopefully there won't be any in endangerment to the population of murex well, fabulous. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our speakers today. That was an extraordinary bolt through the luxurious landscapes of Greater Persia, the Mediterranean, Central Asia, an extraordinary overview of some of these most wonderful objects and production processes to come out of antiquity and still going on today. Um, if you have been to the exhibition, you would have seen, apart from Lloyd's reconstructions, you would have seen some of the powdered pigment that Hassan has produced and some of the shells he's produced it from and some of the garments that he's dyed. We've actually been able to purchase that and purchase some of the other samples that he's done 
ultimately to go hopefully onto permanent display. But we've done that through support of our friends and supporters of the Middle East Department here at the British Museum. And if you are interested in Middle Eastern antiquity, and if you are interested in helping support some of this uh, British Museum research and some of these uh, ways of doing interesting displays, you might have heard of the Beirut glass uh, project that we did reconstructing some of the glassware that was broken in the Beirut port explosion of 2020. That was in part supported by some of our Middle East friends at the British Museum. Well then please do get in touch. Uh, you can email either Sinjin directly, myself directly, or send us an email to the generic Middle East, the email which is simply Middle East at BritishMuseum.org, O-R-G, Middle East at BritishMuseum.org. The Exhibition Luxury and Power Persia de Greece is only got a few more weeks to run. We will close on the 13th of August. So if you haven't seen it, get in fast. And if you have, come back and go and have a look at the costumes, a look at the Oxus treasure, and a look at the purple pigment with very new, fresh eyes. Thank you very much to our speakers and thank you very much to the audience for coming. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.